So I do that and and we can start. So uh, everybody knows actually <laughs> this is uh, we have a today a little seminar on the, our series of seminar about uh, CPG position in marine geophysics. And today uh, we will listen to Jordi Julia with uh, from the Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Norte, in uh, Natal, Brazil. So, I mean, this is yours, Jordi. <laughs> okay, so can I start? Hey, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a delight to be here remotely, right? Uh, and share the, the, my research with all of you. Uh, as you all, all know, this is a presentation which is tied to that uh, to my application for a faculty position at UVO. So I thought that the best I could do was show, give you a sample of the kind of research that I've been doing in Brazil for the past 10 years, which is the time I've been holding a faculty position here at, at the UFRM. So it's a compilation of several papers that have been published, mostly research done through my master and PhD students. Uh, and it revolves about uh, interplate phenomena in Northeast Brazil mostly, particularly in the Borborema province, which is the corner of the South American continent where my university is based. Uh, and then also a little bit about uh, Mesozoic drifting related to the opening of the South Atlantic Ocean. So I, I'm trying to, you know, uh, investigate little bits of uh, different problems and try to come to uh, to, to build a geodynamic geodynamic model for the for the problem. So I'm doing that mostly from passive source imaging, mostly seismology but also in collaboration with colleagues in Barcelona. I am originally from Barcelona. Uh, also on MT uh, imaging, magnetic robotics. So this picture, by the way, is what uh, in Portuguese is called Mofo do Careca, which Mikael knows well, uh, which is Portuguese for the, the hill of the bold man. Uh, it's a sort of geological monument uh, close to my place. I go every morning in that area uh, to jog a little bit and do some exercise. Okay, so let's see if I can. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. I will give in first an overview on the Borborema province, which I uh, suppose that most of you are not familiar with. So I'll be talking mostly about the Precambrian framework and Mesozoic lifting, and then the Xenozoic volcanism and Atlas, which is the, the main focus of my research. And then uh, the compilation of results is mostly divided in two parts. One, which was mostly funded by the uh, INCT of Tectonics Studies, is a sort of national institute uh, that at the beginning of my career here in Brazil uh, gave me support for deployments and for supervi su supervising with students. So at the beginning, of course, I didn't have my own research, so I had to rely on that institute. And that was very, I think was, it was quite successful. And then the second part is about two uh, projects that I PI'd, the so-called Bode's experiment. Uh, Bode is Portuguese for goat, and that's because the region where we deployed was full of goats that we're trying to eat our cables in the anti-deployment. Uh, so it stands for Borborema Deep Electromagnetic and Seismic Experiment. So it's a joint magnetotelluric seismic uh, deployment. And then what I call the three reasons experiment that was a, a project fun funded by Petrobras, the national oil company, to understand the structure uh, of the syndric basins that we have in Northeast Brazil through passive source imaging. Okay, so let's start with the Borborema province. This is the only slide of text that I have, I promise. Uh, so it generally is defined as a structural domain bounded by the Parnaiba Basin, San Francisco Creighton, and the continental margin. Uh, you can see this here in this slide, the Borborema province is the green blob inside the red square. And you can see here to the west is the Parnaiba Basin, which is a large volcanic basin. Uh, uh, in Northeast Brazil, then to the south here is the San Francisco Craton, which used to be linked to the West African Craton before the opening of the Atlantic Ocean 
And then we have here the equatorial margin and the passive margin to the east. So uh, more geologically, the Bulgarian province is regarded as a complex orogenic system that was structured during the Brazilian or Pan-African origin at the end of the Proterozoic. So the most popular model is that it formed Elba, uh, from the amalgamation of several cratonic fragments and microplates that were around, and those were just amalgamated during the Brazilian or Ogeny, forming a large uh, neoproterozoic neo belt that spanned for most of Western Wana. This is just a fragment. Uh, after that, there was extension of stresses related to the opening of the South Atlantic, and some of those or those ex extensional stresses uh, resulted in the formation of several great basins. Uh, some of them succeeded, some not. The ones that succeeded uh, are now the basins on the, along the margin, the continental margin. The ones that are not are aborted great basins. You have here the Reconcavo Tucano Chatova, which is this one. Aralipe and Potiwar, and there are some of the smaller ones around here that form what is called the Cariri Potiwar trend. And finally, and this is the, the part that the most interested me when I first arrived in, in Brazil, is those interplate phenomena uh, related to volcanism and uh, uplift. So we have uh, interplate volcanism along the Macau Queimadas alignment. It's not in the map, but it's, I'll show it later, it's around here, right? And then we have two large topographic features called the Borborema Plateau and the Chapado do Araripe. The Borborema Plateau, it's, uh, both of them are about one kilometer high. The Borborema Plateau is around here. And the Chapado do Araripe is actually this basin. That to me is one of the most mind blowing geological problems <laughs> in the Borborema province. That's a, that's a sedimentary basin that is uh, at one kilometer altitude. How the hell got that there? Is something that we are trying to, to understand. But it's quite an impressive site. Uh, I'll show a picture later uh, when you see it. So let's talk a little bit more about this Precambrian framework. Uh, as I mentioned before, the most popular model is that the Borborema province is the result of an amalgamation of, of several platonic, or sorry, uh, continental fragments and microplates that were you know, uh, dispersed. Uh, around the planet and just came together during the Brazilian and Pan-African uh, orogeny. Uh, you can see here the map with uh, in yellow, there are the, the, the basins, and then in, in color-coded are the different uh, Precambrian units. The thing that is interesting here is this pervasive network of shear zones, uh, more in the east-west direction in the southern portion, more in the northeast-southwest direction in the northern portion, uh, which are supposed to be the Sutures of those continental fragments that I was talking about. So these are shear zones that, in theory, should be on a continental scale. There are some uh, discrepant views about uh, about this model. Uh, there are some authors that consider the Borborema province as a single tectonic block that you know was coherent for the past two billion years. So that these shear zones are just the supercrustal features. There's a lot of, uh, of of research about that. It's not really the focus of my research. Uh, then came the, the mesozoic drifting and the, the common, or the, the consensus that that happened in three stages, which are actually four, because the second stage is split into two. Uh, in the Sindrate one stage, it's about here, this is related, of course, to the opening of the South Atlantic. There was an Afro-Brazilian depression form, which is this gray area over here, uh, which included the, what is now the Aralipe Basin, but didn't go part of north of the path of Lineman, which is this one over here. So those it was related to extensional stresses. More to the north, there was also some expression of these extensional stresses by the intrusion of uh, what is now known as the Sierra medium uh, dikes, based, which are also related to the intrusion of magma, facilitated by, by those extensional stresses. Then the Sindrift to Phase, uh, it has two stages because in the first stage, the stresses were oriented more uh, east west, as you can see here. And that uh, resulted in the synchronous formation of two uh, aborted 
sorry, not aborted uh, at the time, in uh, of two great basins, the Reconcavo to Cano Chatua around here, and the Gabon Sergipe was around here. So these two guys were opening at the same time. Uh, then later on in the new comment, for some reason, uh, the stress is shifted to a more north, uh, west, southeast direction. And opening along these two trends slowed down. And a new one started developing here more to the north, which are what we know as the Caribbean Potiguar trend that includes the Potiguar Basin here in the north and the Aralipe Basin here in the south and some other uh, smaller basins in between. Then by the Bahrainian uh, stresses change again to a more east-west direction, starting the uh, same with three phase. Uh, then it's when the Caribbean Potiquar uh, trend just aborted, uh, and also the Reconcavo to and everything developed along the Gabon Sergipe Alagoas uh, trend, which is what now forms the continental margin in South America and Africa. So moving now to the uh, interpolate phenomena. We have this uh, mesogen of volcanism because we have here the, the green lines, which is those uh, Sierra marine dikes that were related to the opening of the South Atlantic and the Sindri phase one that I mentioned before. We have down here the Cabo volcanism, uh, which has a more uncertain origin, or at least I couldn't find any clear explanation on why we have volcanism down there. And the one that interest is, interested me the most is this volcanic line. Uh, in here is called the Macau Caymanas alignment. Uh, Macau is a uh, Brazilian city up here in the north. Caymanas is from here in the south. Uh, and this forms a linear trend, which is, is it's important to remember that it doesn't have an, an age progression. And it's kind of synchronous with this other magmatic alignment here. This is the Fernando de Noronha archipelago. And here is message line. So there is another magmatic line here and more in the east-west direction, which has a time overlap with this north-south line. Uh, and that one, however, does have a clear age progression. So, and then we have the topographic update. This is a topographic map. You can see it here more clearly the, the, the plan out of the Borborema or Borborema Plateau from 1,000 meters altitude. And here, the Chapada do Aradipi, completely flat, because as I said before, this is a sedimentary basin at one kilometer altitude, uh, which are the, the main expressions of this topographic uplift uh, that happened inside of the, of the province. And it's interesting that uh, dating of this uplift reveals that there is some overlap with the Mesozoic volcanism. So there are a number of geodynamic models that try to explain that. And some of them try to explain both volcanism and interplate uplift through a common mechanism. So, okay, that ends the review of the Borborema province. Uh, then I, I will start with a compilation that I promised before. And as I said at the beginning, those were studies funded by the INCP, uh, the National Institute in Tectonic Studies, which is a very large project which is coordinated by Professor Reinhard Fuch at the University of Brasilia. It involves several other universities in Brazil, in particular three universities in Northeast Brazil, uh, Ceará, Pernambuco, and, and us, Rio Grande do Norte, along with other uh, universities in the South region. Uh, and, you know, uh, that was a big help uh, for my beginning here in Brazil. So what I proposed, Inside within this this uh, this institute was to deploy a number of seismic stations in the province. At the time, the stations that we had in North States Brazil belonged to the national seismic network. So these are the dark blue triangles that you see in this figure. A total of eleven stations. We had uh, RCBR2, which is also an international monitoring station, and some uh, three or four more scattered temporary deployments. But there were many stations. So I proposed to densify that network with the addition of more stations. We built a seismic line here, which had the, the green triangles, which we call the passive line. 
uh, which is made from broadband stations that we borrowed from a national pool of seismic equipment. And then uh, these red triangles, which are short period stations, not ideal, but that's uh, the, the equipment that we had that were deployed here, mostly in the Borborema plateau and surrounding regions. Because at the time, my focus was in understanding the volcanism and the, and the origin of this Borborema, of this uplift in the, in the, in the Borborema plateau. So total, we had uh, 50 plus seismic stations deployed for a period of about two years. So the models that were proposed for the uplift in the Borborema plateau uh, and the volcanism come in a variety of forms and shapes. We have here the, the plume model, which, you know, taking into account that the macau kelly mothers alignment is a, uh, it has a linear trend. Somebody in our department proposed that it could be related to a mantle plume centered under the Borborema plateau. So when the plate moves above the plume, it makes a, a volcanic line as we observed in the macau came out as alignment. And then that should have a topographic dome center around the pond that could be the Borborema plateau. That was the explanation. Many problems with this model, mostly that, you know, the volcanic alignment should have an edge progression, which, uh, let me go back here, which, with uh, the volcanism that I have. Then since it is horrible with this east-west trending alignment here, that means that the plate should be doing a very strange movement, you know, turning at 90 degrees in order to make this shape, which is, doesn't seem realistic. And finally, you know, the volume of volcanism is not very expressive. Uh, it's not very big as, as we might ex expect from a mantle. So I, I didn't, I didn't need to much to this model, but you know, it's, it, it was up there. Then there was a, a, a geodetic uh, anomaly uh, study, uh, joint anomaly study, sorry, uh, led by Naomi Usami at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, that from joint anomalies, they uh, identified an anomalous body of low density under the Borgorema Plateau, which they identified as a sort of thermal perturbation. That would explain the uplift. And why not if it is, uh, you know, hotter than uh, usual, it could also trigger the melts that make the Macau Kerr Matas line, right? Then there is a, this other model here by uh, Morais Neto that, that relates to the opening of the southern line. So he doesn't believe that the uplift of the Borgorema Plateau was in the Xenozoic, it was earlier. And it relates that uplift to the opening of the South Atlantic. So somehow due to the, due to the opening, there was a lateral flow of lower crustal and lithospheric material to the size that would, you know, pond under what it is uh, presently the Borborema plateau. Uh, problem is that numerical modeling showed that that would explain about 600 meters of uplift. So to uh, complete the 400 meter meters that are missing, he postulated that there, there should be some sort of mafic underplate in the province that you know gave the, the final push to the, the 1,000 meter. 1,000 meters. That didn't give an, an, an origin for that mafic underwood, but he postulated it. And then finally, we had this other model, which is related to the development of a small scale convection cell at the continental margin, uh, which is quite telling because it explains simultaneously the uplift and the volcanism. Uh, according to this model, we would have. Uh, Small scale convection cell developed here at the border that would kind of erode the lithosphere and trigger the melts that in the plateau would accumulate at the base of the crest and cost and, and cause the uplift. And more to the north, it would find the way to the surface and result in the volcanism that we see in, in the province. So we have all these four models, and I set myself to see, okay, let's see if we can discriminate among them. And my first target was the plume model. I didn't believe much in it, but I thought, okay, let's 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 test it with seismology. And one of the things that that we can do is is map with seismology, is map the the thickness of the transition zone. That's important because if there is a plume centered on the Volgorema plateau, it is well known that uh, as the discontinuities that bound the upper mantle transition zone between 410 and 600, 670 kilometers depth are uh, temperature, temperature dependent, 
uh, if we had a mantle plume going through the transition zone under the Borbonema plateau, we should see a transition zone that is thinner than normal. Usually the thickness is about 150 kilometers. If we have a plume under the Borbonema plateau, due to, to this opposite behavior uh, with temperature of the 410 and the 660 kilometers discontinuity, uh, we should see a thinning of the transition zone, right? So to do that, uh, I resorted to receiver functions. Uh, for you, for those of you who are not familiar with this methodology, this is quite popular in passive source seismology. It's a sort of processing of teleseismic recordings that enhances the conversions from P to S wave at these continuities, right? So you can do the processing, migrate the receiver functions uh, at depth, and you should see peaks like these ones at the depths where there is a seismic discontinuity. So we can see here, for example, the north-south cross section and east-west cross sections that are indicated here in the map. And we see the 410 loud and clear in here and the 660 also around here. There is a 520, which is predicted by mineralogic models, but doesn't add much to the story, but we can see it here also uh, popping up. So we did, you know, this kind of uh, migration for using the, the seismic stations, only the broadband stations, unfortunately, the period stations do not are not useful for this kind of studies. And we you know arrange the, the the results in bins and we calculated uh, transition zone thickness for each one of these bins. So the results are color coded here color coded here in, in the map. In green, uh, we have Transition zone thickness that is nominal, 250 kilometers, so nothing unusual. Red is thinner than normal, blue <coughs> is thicker than normal. So you can see that here where the Borborema plateau sits is basically green, which means that there is no thermal perturbation of the transition zone and no plot. So we published that. That was the work of a master student, Adriane Pinheiro. We published that in 2014 in the Geophysical Journal International. Definitely. Definitely uh, discrediting the plume model for the uplift in the of the Borborema plateau. Then uh, my next goal was to see if I could map uh, that layer of mafic underplate under the plateau. Remember that there are two models that predict that there should be mafic underplate under that plateau that would explain <coughs> the the topographic uplift. So that should be seen here in the Borborema plateau and missing uh, everywhere else, right? So uh, it should be thicker than, you know, I would expect thicker crust here in the bottom of the plateau, thinner crust here outside. Also the, the VPBS ratio should be different because that's sensitive to the content in silica. So more mafic rocks tend to have a larger VPBS ra uh, ratio while uh, more calcic rocks have a, a smaller VPBS ratio. So there is a technique also based on receiver functions called H-kappa stacking that allows us to obtain exactly those parameters crustal thickness and bulk BPBS ratio for the grass. Here we have an example. Uh, this is the sort of a stacking approach. This is the stacking surface and the maximum gives you the values that you're looking for. And in this case, it would be like 32 kilometers for the crustal thickness, 1.77 for the BPBS ratio. And this is here in the maps, a summary of crustal thicknesses and BPBS ratios. Probably the numbers are too small for you to see in detail. So you can see a summary here in this diagram. Uh, on the horizontal axis is crustal thickness, on the vertical axis is BPBS ratio. Uh, blue dots refer to a station uh, outside the Borborema plateau. Red dots refer, refer to stations in the Borborema plateau. So what, what you can see is that indeed the crustal thickness of the Borborema plateau is larger by five, six kilometers when compared to uh, crust of the Borborema plateau. Right, so that, that, that matches the, the prediction of those models. The BPDF ratio, however, is hard to tell because you can see it just spans a wide range. So uh, we don't see an increase in BPDF ratio in the plateau when compared to other sites. Uh, but that could be just a, a lack of resolution. It's, it's just inconclusive. It doesn't mean that it's, it's not there, but we don't see it here. We even run a, a synthetic test to see if we had the resolution to do that. Uh, we use nominal values for uh, crustal lithologies. So we built a crust from calcic crust or a mafic crust 
using two different market lithologies from a compilation by uh, Christensen and Mooney in 1995. Uh, and we set the crustal thickness to 36.5, which is the average from the receiver functions, and then alter the thickness of the, the mapping lower crust from zero to 10. So BPVS ratio didn't change much because it's the boom BPVS ratio. Of course, as the as the thickness increases, the boom BPVS ratio increases too. Is that's the red line, the the black line, sorry, and the red line just indicates the average BPVS ratio that we found from the for the plateau using the receiver conscious. The crossing is at five five point five kilometers, which means that if we had infinite precision, we would be predicting a layer of about five kilometers of mapping material under the plateau. However, when we add confidence bounds, things just go nuts because the confidence bounds are just so big that any interpretation is possible. So these were results published by a PhD student uh, in technophysics uh, in 2015. Uh, so we were it was inconclusive in regard to the mafia, uh, the existence of the mafia play. So we went a bit further and we tried to do a modeling of the receiver functions. Uh, to get a detailed uh, velocity model for the Borborema province. Uh, and we resulted to uh, an approach that I developed within my PhD work. It's called the Joint Inversion of Receiver Functions and Surface Waste Dispersion. That was at the end of the last century. Mm -hmm. uh, it depended in 1999, so it was quite a long time ago, but it's been quite useful and I've been using it everywhere and other people as well. So we needed uh, an update on the surface uh, wave dispersion for the uh, for the region. So my student Rosanna just read it, uh, surface wave tomography for the entire South American continent. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't publish that, but it's in her PhD uh, thesis, and we use the results for the Borborema province for that uh, joint inversion. Uh, problem with the uh, surface waves is that they usually don't, don't provide the short periods that are necessary to constrain crustal structure well. So I had another student, uh, Rafael Diaz, uh, working on an ambient noise tomography at the time was a kind of new approach. It's basically based on the fact that when you have recording some ambient noise at two stations and you do the cross correlation, uh, if you start enough data, you can reconstruct the green function between these two stations. Uh, so there you can see here the surface waves emerging from the cross correlograms at different distances. And then once you have the, the green functions retrieved, you can apply the usual uh, measurement of dispersion velocities and create uh, dispersion velocity maps like the ones here for short periods that the advantage that we had. So, so basically we constructed this project course using long periods from the traditional surface wave tomography and short periods from the uh, ambient noise uh, tomography. Again, for this ambient noise tomography, we could only use uh, long uh, broadband stations. For the receiver functions, we could use the, the short periods, no problem. But for this uh, lower frequency studies, unfortunately the short period stations are not uh, Useful. So you can see here at five and ten seconds, we see slow velocities matching the sedimentary basins, fast velocities matching the Precambrian region. So it looked like it, it worked pretty well. Uh, so then we did the the modeling, of the the simultaneous the joint modeling of receiver functions, which are these traces over here, and the dispersion velocities, which are over here. That's an example for station RCDR, and the red line is the velocity model with uh, confident bounce in gray uh, around it. So we can, with this methodology, we can develop a detailed uh, velocity depth profile under each of the seismic stations. So we did that for all the stations here in the Borgonema province. And uh, this slide is a summary of the results. So, okay, the axes here are plotted following the uh, following the, 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 the following criteria. Uh, the vertical axis is centered at four kilometers per second. So anything left to the vertical axis is slower than four, to the right is faster than four. That is important because mapping material is supposed to be around four kilometers. So if we have crustal material with velocity larger than four, that it's probably mapping material. If it is slower, it, it's not. And then the horizontal axis is centered at 30 kilometers. So that allows to see the MOFO above or, or below and determine if it is thin crust or thick crust. 
Now, the stations in the upper portion are stations that are outside the Bulborima Plateau, which are these, uh, these ones around here. And you can see that in general, there are 30, 32 kilometers in good agreement with each Kappa stacking results. And most importantly, that velocities are below four kilometers per second. And these are, those are as with velocities, by the way. So it looks like it's thin and no mafic underplay. Then if we go to the south, these are the stations in the Borborema Plateau. We can see that they are thicker, right? The Moko is below 30 kilometers, 35, 36, which is what we see for the Borborema Plateau. And most importantly, this extra thickness is caused by material that is above four kilometers per second. So it looks like indeed the prediction of those models was correct. The thickening or the, the Borborema Plateau is thicker because it contains a layer of mafic underplate. The interesting point here was these four guys over here. These are stations that are located in the Borborema Plateau, right? But that display a thin crust and no mafic material. In particular, these guys are the ones over here, are those four guys. So it looks like we have two types of crust inside the Borborema Plateau. South of the Patos lineament is thick and has a mafic underplate. North of the Patos lineament is thin and doesn't have mafic underplate. So these four guys over here in the Borborema Plateau have basically the same crust rock structure as anything else around, but it just happens to be higher. Okay, so this is a summary of the results. You can see here these blue dots, they are thin crust with no mafic underplate. These more grayish dots are uh, thick crust with mafic underplate. So taken at face value, we would say that, okay, that seems to be confirming the edge-driven convection model that uh, Oliveira and Medeiros proposed some time ago. However, uh, I had the idea also of doing another kind of a study with uh, receiver function. That was another master thesis uh, by Igor Almeida, established in Teton Physics in 2015. And we use what is called the CCP stack, which is a way of migrating receiver functions in a more 3D fashion to map seismic discontinuities. And when we did that, we see them showing here two cross lines, two cross sections uh, in the east west direction. We see here uh, uh, upper crustal, uh, we see here an, an, an the, the moho at the expected depth, nice and clear in both profiles. And we see also a intercrustal discontinuity about 10 kilometers that it is observed in the northern portion, but it's not observed in the southern portion. So here it's much fainter or almost missing. If we switch to the north-south cross sections, uh, you can see here how, especially in the FF line cross section, how the discontinuity is nice and clear here in, in the north, and then it just fades away as it enters the southern border. So it looks like that thin crust uh, that we see that we determined from the joint inversion of receiver function and surface based dispersion comes with an intercrustal discontinuity that is missing in the thin, in the thick crust, right? It's an additional feature. So why is that? Why did that discontinuity develop in one type of crust and, and not the other one? And the thing is that what people, I think, fail to notice when uh, understanding the Borborema crust of sector is that the thin crust, 30, 32 kilometers, is not normal. That's that's extended crust. The average crust, crustal thickness in continents is 38, 40 kilometers. So the uplifted crust, the, the Borborema plateau crust, is more normal than anything else that is around. So what we propose in that paper is that this intercrustal discontinuity is just an intercrustal detachment that was formed for uh, after the extension of the crust that is now 30, 32 kilometers deep. So if we are correct, that means that, that implies a completely different story for the topography of the Borborema Plateau. It's not that we had a 30, 32 kilometers crust that was underplated and then uplifted. It could be all the, all the other way around. We could have a thick crust that was left standing at the, at the right altitude and then 
the rest was stretched and because it was a stretch, it subsided and created that differential topography. The question then is, okay, so what's the origin of that matrix lower crust, right? And if we check a compilation of the Cambrian crust of a structure worldwide, we can see that proterozoic crust, which is the age of the crust in the Borbonella province, does usually have a matrix underplate, but it's not Xenozoic in origin, it's, it's Precambrian, right? So, you know, having a thick crust with a um, layer of mafic underplate of proterozoic age, it's expected. What it's not expected is having a thin crust without, without that layer of mafic underplate in a proterozoic terrain. So, uh, considering that, what we did is we proposed with uh, Rosanna this uh, evolutionary model for the Borromarema province, in which we would start with a nominal Precambrian or proterozoic crust with a mafic layer. Uh, due to compression during the Brazilian orogeny, we would have the lamination in this part of the of the crust and partial the lamination in the other on the other crust. That would imply a real logic contrast between this portion and this portion of the Borborema province. And then during Mesozoic extension, the thin crust would just be stretched and subside, forming the Serpentine depression, and uh, the rest would be left that it was forming the Borborema uh, plateau. So that was basically a radical change in the point of view about the, the evolution of the Borborema plateau and, and the Borborema province in general. So we tried here to uh, then to, to look for additional evidence for this geological context because so far it is, is based exclusively in the presence of these intercrustal detachments. So we were trying to find, we wanted to find additional evidence. And for that, I partnered with a colleague uh, at, the, at Imperial College, Ian Bastel, to do uh, an SKS splitting analysis uh, using the broadband stations. The idea is that, well, SKS splitting analysis gives you an idea of the uh, amount of anisotropy that you have in the upper mantle. Uh, and the idea is, okay, let's do this kind of analysis. If anisotropy is related to deformation. Uh, so what I would expect is that, you know, if the Borbolema plateau is geologically stronger than anything else, anisotropy should be smaller in the plateau when compared to the surrounding areas. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the SKS is splitting anisotropy. We didn't want to talk about that. We wanted to talk about something else. Uh, we did get interesting results in what the paper published. We saw, you know, the, the axis of orientation for anisotropy perpendicular in the passive margin parallel to the equatorial margin, which, you know, is consistent with uh, extension. Uh, with extension uh, during the opening of the South Atlantic and the Equatorial Atlantic. Uh, unfortunately, in some stations around here, we didn't see any anisotropy at all, which is also kind of weird. But here in the Borbonema Plateau, because we needed to use broadband stations, and those broadband stations happened to be close to the shear zones, we really could get a good, get a good grasp about how much the sublimation we had in the latest year. So, okay, uh, it was at this point uh, that I got funding from uh, CMPQ, which, our, which is our national uh, funding body for research. Uh, and since I was also interested in the uplift of the Chapada do Guadalupe, I proposed an experiment in, in the eastern portion of the Borborema province. So this is the, the image that I promised you to show. This is the Chapada do Guadalupe. This is an impressive view. It's completely flat on top at the sedimentary basin. Uh, that is at one kilometer uh, altitude. So what we propose, what I proposed uh, together with a colleague in, in, in Spain in at the Marine Science Institute in Barcelona was to do a joint seismic and magnetotelluric deployment. So we proposed to do a north-south line crossing the Arabic basin around here in which one of these sites was populated with a seismic station and a long period magnetotelluric station. In total, what Top points we used uh, that were left in, in place for three, four weeks. Uh, the idea is that with this amount of time, we can get long periods and sample lithospheric depths. And then for the passive source seismology, we used uh, the typical deployment with uh, two years of continuous uh, recording. 
So one of the things, the first things that I did with these stations before focusing on the Chapada to Guadalupe was try to uh, revisit, you know, uh, an isotopy studies for the entire province, province and adding now the, the new stations. Uh, that's something that I did in collaboration with uh, Gaia Mark at the time at IFREMER. Uh, she was here in Natal uh, as a postdoc under my supervision for one year. And she did a wonderful work uh, analyzing the silver functions uh, and isotopy using the silver functions, uh, which uh, allows to, to constrain the, the depth of an isotopy better than SKS splitting. SKS splitting is just an integrated value for the entire upper mantle. With the silver functions, you can focus only on uh, the lithosphere. So what I was expecting to see and what you have to see here to pay attention here is in the color coding of the station, which is the energy or in other words, the size of the anisotropy. I was expecting to see, you know, uh, darker colors here in the Borborema Plateau and hotter colors around, indicating that the anisotropy here is weaker than anything else around. Kind of see that, but it's not really very obvious. So unfortunately, again, an isotopy was not useful for this kind of problem. Uh, we were able to say things about other stuff related to the opening of the South Atlantic, but not on this particular problem. What it really helped was the speed wave tomography that was part of a PhD. Uh, dissertation that I supervised uh, from Flodoaldo Simois Neto. Uh, we published these results in GJI in 2019. And what you can see here is uh, a slice at 200 kilometers depth. So this is a P wave tomography, which uh, allows to uh, image uh, changes in seismic, lateral changes in seismic velocity at different depths. So blue is faster than average, red is slower than average. Uh, and what we see is that the southern Borborema Plateau is mostly blue. Anything uh, north of the Patos Lineamin is mostly red. Now, blue and red, as I said, is related to faster, slower velocities, which in turn are related to temperatures. So these should be basically colder, these should be hotter, which in turn affects rheology. So, colder material usually is geologically stronger than hotter material. So it seems that we are indeed seeing this geological contrast that uh, we were predicting with Rosanna. So it seems that the southern Borborema Plateau is geologically stronger than the northern Borborema Plateau, which would support our interpretation of the differential stretching of the uh, Borborema uh, lithosphere. Uh, so that kind of settles the, the model for the uplift. Uh, but what is missing now is an explanation for that volcanism here in the Macauke Matters line. So if we go to 100 kilometers depth, what we found was this huge red blob right here at the corner, bounded by the Macauke Matters line itself and the Patos Linium over here. So what we interpreted is this is that this is sublithosphatic flow bonding in this region. Uh, the reason for that is that when we published the tomography, we also postulated that this red region over here that you can see, this is kind of the result of a sublithosphatic flow uh, from a distant mantle plume. That's a crazy model proposed by Norman Wesley. Uh, he proposed that uh, all volcanism which is 85 million years old or younger in Northeast Brazil comes from a plume that is presently centered under the Paraná basin, like 2,500 kilometers away from the Northeast region. So that plume just gets material up, hits the lithosphere, and then that travels laterally, bordering the San Francisco Craton into the uh, Borborema province and is responsible for the Macaulay Mandas line. So of course we we cannot support we cannot uh, validate this model, but if that were correct, this red region over here could be part of that flow that is approaching the northeast Brazil and is spawning right here. So lithospheric thickness here would be thinner and would allow the accumulation of material that would be responsible for the interplate volcanism. So okay, moving on. Uh, I think the talk is 50 minutes, right? So I have like 15 minutes left. 
or something like that, maybe a little bit less. So let's move to the Chapada do Araripe now. Uh, there are basically two models for to explain the the inversion of this basin. One is uh, proposed by two Frenchmen, uh, Paul Bast and Betar. They, they propose that the Borborema province as a whole was uplifted, and then due to different resistance to erosion of the surface materials, that created the topography that we see today. So the Chapada do Araripe, even though it's formed by sediments, that those would be extremely resilient sediments that resist erosion if that keep at this altitude and form the Chapada do Araripe, along with other plateaus that we see uh, spread in, in the province. Um, and then there is this other model by Marcus and a colleague uh, here at the UFRN, Professor uh, Vilario, that proposed that no, what did happen is that simply uh, the basin was inverted. I mean, we had the normal folds that flanked the basin that would form during the extension in the Mesozoic, one of those aborted reef basins. And then, you know, the region became under compression. And those normal folds were recycled into reverse folds. Right. So basically, instead of going down the, the, the compression, the, the basin popped up and stayed at one kilometer altitude. I mean, from a mechanical point of view, this model is kind of difficult to make it work because normal faults are high angle faults. And you know, getting that thing up at those high angles, you need, you know, considerable amount of stresses to get to that point. I mean, the way they kind of uh go around this promise, they say, okay, there is some strike slip component, so it's not that it was going perpendicularly up, it was at an angle, so that facilitated the, the uplift of the basin. So anyway, we did uh, receiver functions, again, with uh, those stations that we deployed. We see here thin crust in the Borbonema province, thin, thin crust in the San Francisco Creighton, uh, variations in BDPS ratio that kind of follow the secular variation of cross structure. structure. Uh, the most interesting portion, however, was about lithospheric uh, structure, because we see or we found that lithosphere is thinner in the Borborema province when compared more to the south in the San Francisco region. So we see a sort of change in lithospheric thickness along the profile. It wasn't very well defined, but it was kind of there. We published this in Tectonophysics in 2021. That was, again, part of a PhD dissertation that I am uh, supervising. The uh, other interesting result was that we placed an, a short period test station right on top of the basin. So the basin is here, right between AR03 and AR04. These are two broadband stations flanking the basin. So the short period station was right on top. Uh, the results are not very uh, robust or very, very well determined, but we kind of see an increase in velocity at the bottom of the class, which we interpreted as uh, mapping underplay. So there seems that the, the, the basin, the LNP basin has some sort of mapping underplay that could help with that uplift uh, and, and contribute or help the, the compressive stresses. But the really impressive result came from MT modeling. This is the result of a 3D modeling of magnetotelluric data on those stations. And we saw this huge conductive anomaly, which is centered right under that LNP basin. So we interpreted that as uh, lithospheric flow. So it's just a thin lithosphere, 120 kilometers, uh, that shows that the lithosphere under the other basin base is thinner than anything else around. Uh, and what we propose is that, okay, this is this thin lithosphere could facilitate lateral flow of a material that would provide the heat to trigger the melts that cause that mafic underplate. So, what we propose here is that the uplift of the Chapada do Araripe is not just because of compression due to uh, tectonic stresses, as proposed by Marcus, but that, that uplift of those compression was aided by thermal buoyancy from this thin lithosphere plus uh, composition of buoyancy from the underplated mafic material. Uh, of course, uh, we then try to see that in a in the tomographic slice, and you can kind of see here under the Araripe basin, there is this sort of reddish, which you know it's in good agreement with what we see with, with what we see with the uh, resistivity model from the empty station. So that's probably we remember we interpreted that as a sort of lateral flow that comes from far away. So this is maybe just an offshoot of this material that is going under the basin. 
In any case, this uh, slice shows an important uh, feature. Uh, you can see here two regions at, of elevated topography, the Borborema Plateau at one kilometer, the other DP basin at one kilometer with completely different uh, subcrustal and sublithospheric structures uh, underneath. So there have to be different reasons working at the same time to explain these similar topography for these two regions. Uh, of course, we also tried to do a joint inversion of magnetopolitic and seismological data. This is a work that we're about to submit to Geophysical Journal International. Uh, and well, unfortunately, it didn't contribute much to the geodynamic story that I am trying to build for the Burrema province, because this kind of inversion is really tricky. Uh, the first difficulty is that Seismological data can be managed to be modeled with 1D models. Uh, Magnetotologic data is mostly 3D. And existing codes for this joint inversion assume that both the resistivity and seismic structure are 1D. So in here we are approximating these are the black lines, the, the resistivity structure with a layered model. And the only constraint between the resistivity and seismic models is that the layering has to be the same. So the number of layers and the thickness of the layers for both the seismic and resistivity model are identical, right? Uh, that's the only feedback between the two uh, models, the only, the only link, the only constraint between the two models. So the nice result is that we managed to explain the data with common lighting for both resistivity and seismic velocity. So these, the red lines is the velocity structure from the, the other gen inversion using seismological data only. The black lines are from the gen inversion with magnetotopoly. They agree pretty well. We see the same crustal thicknesses. And this is the comparison for the uh, resistivity profiles from the joint inversion with seismic, seismological data and the 1D profiles extracted from the 3D model using empty data only. So the, the, the long wavelength features are similar. But we had uh, many difficulties, as I said before. First of all, we had to kind of uh, trample with the resistivity profiles to correct for the static sheet. Uh, the problem is that galvanic distortion near the surface causes a static sheet. And the only way to correct for that uh, in uh, 1D modeling of resistivity profile of, of empty data is by shifting the apparent resistivity curves up and down so that the resulting 1D profiles match what we see in the 3D model, right? So this sim similarity is kind of fake because we force that to be in the same range. But variations, are, those are constrained by the data and they are similar. The other problem is that this code only accepts phase velocities and we don't have a phase velocity map for the Borborema province. So we had to develop that and we couldn't, like, couldn't get uh, periods long enough to, to sample the lithos the lithosphere. So anything that is deeper than 60 kilometers really is not well constrained by the seismological data. Right. So we were expecting to kind of the the resistivity models drive the, the thinning of the lithosphere in the seismic velocity models, but we couldn't we couldn't see that. What we did see, however, is that when we had the seismic model, we also had, especially in these stations here, uh, resistivity jump in the resistivity models. So it seems that the, the seismological data is helping the resistivity model to place an electric model in the resistivity models, right? And this is kind of cool because the electric model is kind of elusive. It's very hard to determine with electromagnetic data alone. So it kind of seems that through the joint inversion, we can do that. So there is a lot of, my, my point is that we tried, didn't work as well as, as we expected because of you know several difficulties we're learning. So I expect in the future to keep working on that and be able to do a better job imaging lithospheric structure through a joint inversion of magnetotopoly and uh, seismological data. And OK, I feel that I have been talking for too long. Uh, just uh, three more slides, and I'll be done. I'll be quick. Just mentioning, so all that that I, I was mentioning before was about this uh, interplate phenomena uplift and uh, interplate volcanism. Uh, later on, I shifted more to the drifting problem. Uh, so I got funding from Petrobras a few years ago to deploy seismic stations in these three basins, Aranipe, Potiwar, and Tucano Reconcavo, which are the three 
aborted reef basins that, that we have in Brazil. The data for the other data was used by uh, Anna Milena in her PhD. Uh, so that was implicit, that's already published. And then they had two master students working, one on the Potiwa version and one on the Tucano basin. So this is, by the way, pandemic research. That was done entirely during the pandemic. It was a pain in the ass. So what I proposed was to deploy these 20 stations uh, here in the Potiwa Basin, those are the, the red blobs uh, here in the Reconcavo Tucano and Aradite. Uh, the first thing that you had, I want you to notice from this slide is the amount of the improvement in seismic coverage in the Borborema province. When I arrived in Brazil, it was only the green dots. These are the, the seismic network stations. And right now is everything else. So, you know, step by step, by step, the different projects, I've been able to improve dramatically the seismic coverage in the Borborema province and also part of the San Francisco Bay of Lanquip. So this is a picture from the deployment. These are the technicians working, and this is me playing PI and supervising the work of the technicians. Uh, so, okay, just two more slides. Uh, this is uh, the, the results from the, the Concavo Tucano Basin. Very briefly, the problem here from the existing literature revolved about whether the basin was formed through simple shear or pure shear, right? Uh, so those are four different models that were proposed for the formation of the of the Tucano Reconcavo Basin Rift System. Pure shear, uh, simple simple shear over here, a mixture of all of them, simple shear in the crust, uh, pure shear in the mantle, and this is a double simple uh, a double system of simple shear uh, extension. So the the controversy here was came from the following: is that all these models were based on gravity modeling. And as you can see, simple shear predicts that the crustal thinning should be away from the basin, the basin that is developing, right? While uh, pure shear predicts that the crustal thinning should happen right under the basin, right? So it's kind of interesting that gravity modeling is so non-unique because all these models were based on gravity modeling, basically from the same data set, some of them finding that there is crustal thinning under the basin, some of them finding that there is no crustal thinning under the basin, using gravity modeling, using exactly the same, not exactly, but very similar data set. So I propose to catalyze, okay, let's put some seismographic stations in those basins. I will tell you if the crust is thin or not. So that's what we did. And surprisingly, uh, we found that the crustal thickness under the Basin drift system is not very different from the craton that is to the west. So we have similar crustal thicknesses 41, 44, 43, 41. What is thinner is the crust more to the east in the Borborema province. Right? Uh, we also did the joint inversion and we found that these stations that are in black, they have a layer of mafic underplate under them. So we kind of uh, analyzing the results, uh, supported this model here, which is called the cantilever model. Uh, that's because uh, this model predicts, you know, simple shear for the crust, pure shear for the uh, lithospheric mantle, and also predicts in order to match the uh, uplift history of this basin. It's also postulated that there should be a layer of mafic underplate under the basin. Uh, which was not found by the gravity studies. But we did find it. Uh, by the way, uh, Mikhail uh, is a co-author in this paper. If you have questions, you can ask him. Uh, but we propose that, you know, we our, our data is more consistent with the cantilever model and that, you know, pure shear happened in the lithospheric mantle while simple shear happened in, uh, in the crust. Uh, and then the results for the Potiwar Basin, uh, we focused on a different problem. Uh, this is an unusual reef basin because its heat flow is very high. It's about 100 milliwatts per square meter, uh, which is kind of unusual. Uh, and heat flow studies, they don't have very good constraints about that. They postulated from the width of the thermal of the heat flow anomaly that there should be some anomalous bodies providing the heat at about 20 kilometers depth. So when we did the joint inversion and 
and then the modeling, what we found is that the interesting result was this velocities here, that would be the most like 30 something kilometers, which matches well other estimates of cross thickness of the protein water basin. But let's say the uppermost mantle material has a velocity around 4.3 kilometers per second. This velocity is too fast to be considered crustal material and too slow to be considered upper mantle material. So what we propose is that these are actually magmatic intrusions in the upper mantle that lowers the velocity and that provide the heat uh, that fits this 101 milliwatts per square meter of heat flow that we see in the surface. This was again another master thesis was published this year in the Journal of Geodynamics by Tabitha Barbosa uh, uh, during the pandemic. I mean, that's again, this is, this is pandemic research. It was quite, quite pain to get things done during that time. So that's all I have to say. Uh, these are the conclusions. I'll just leave them here. And, you know, if you have any questions, I'll take them. I'll take them. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi, for the this presentation. Uh, so uh, maybe there are questions, and if you are online and you want to ask a question, just let me know. Questions? <laughs> Euh, ouais. Ouais, Alors, je ne sais pas comment on lève la main, mais moi j'aurais plusieurs questions évidemment. Euh, mais euh, bah, euh, sur euh, les, les températures de Curie, sur euh, euh, l'anisotropie, mais ma, ma vraie question, c'est que nous, évidemment, on est très intéressé par la transition continent-océan. Et donc, ça m'intéresse de savoir euh, ce que la sismologie passive pourrait résoudre euh, dans, la, dans, dans le manteau, dans, euh, dans la lithosphère, dans cette transition océan-continent. So Philippe, can you rephrase in English, please? Oh, ah, uh, ah, uh, oui, bien sûr. Ah, uh, sorry. Ah, uh, so uh, my main question, because that's our uh, topic of interest at the yes. uh, is a uh, continent ocean transition. Yes. And uh, um, we are searching, but we don't know exactly what can uh, passive seismology bring to uh, the characterization of the continental versus Oceanic mantle, uh, mm -hmm. the anisotropy, um, the lithosphere, the, the, I was mentioning earlier, uh, exhumed versus. Uh, uh, mantle, crust, voilà, that's, that's my question. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, of course, uh, as, as you have noticed, all the research that I have done so far implies deployments online, right? Uh, if I wanted to contribute on the problem of the continent ocean transition, I would I would need kind of hybrid deployments that involve both on land and uh, ocean bottom, right? Uh, from what I know, Ifremer is pretty good at deploying OBSs. Uh, I'm not sure how uh, how much experience you have with broadband OBSs, which is the kind of data that I would need. Uh, to apply the kind of analysis that I have been showing on hybrid deployments. But my guess would be that the, the, my, my way to go to, to tackle that problem would, would be to propose hybrid deployments, part of uh, broadband stations, part on land, part offshore, right? Uh, and then do apply the, the, the traditional uh, passive source imaging techniques to determine, I mean, surface wave tomography, trouble time tomography, uh, anisotropy, all that can be 
uh, applied to broadband stations uh, at the at the sea bottom. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. some, you know, correction uh, because there are the reverberations in the in the water layer, but there are you know papers. Uh, I recall now one in New Zealand. Uh, and we say made a hybrid deployment in the islands and in the uh, in the submerged basins around that gave pretty impressive results about the electrostatic structure for both the, the immersed immersed and submerged portions of the of the islands. So my guess is that that could be done equally well in in Northeast Brazil or other parts of the world. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the uh, logistics of deploying OBSs. Uh, I guess that, you know, it's not that they can be deployed everywhere. Uh, in some sites, so maybe we should be careful about how we select the study area. Uh, so that would yep. be one possibility. Another possibility, and I don't know if Ithamar has any experience with that, is the mermaid kind of sensors. Uh, these are the floating seismometers. So these are basically stations that are floating in water in the Sulfur Channel, if I recall it correctly. It has the downside that you know it doesn't it doesn't provide information on the S wave because S waves don't propagate in water, but they have been used for travel time tomography, for instance. And yeah, we studied uh, that ten years ago. Uh, uh, but you you're right. Uh, actually, deployment of um, broadband OBS is not that complicated. Uh, uh -huh. When you're doing it passively, uh, it's the shooting part that is a, a problem, and that's why you are uh, uh, an, an, an area of uh, uh, interest in this uh, continent yeah. ocean transition because uh -huh. you do yeah. it passively. Yeah. So doing yeah the the price you have to pay for passive source deployments is that you need to leave the stations in place for a longer time. Yeah. Passive source. You have the advantage that okay, you deploy it, shoot, and as soon as you have done with the shooting, you can remove the stations. Well, we're looking at instruments that could not broadband, but that could uh -huh. be deployed for 30 to 45 days. Uh -huh. uh, we don't know exactly if that's enough. Yeah, well, it depends on, on what you want to do. For ambient noise tomography, uh, usually, ideally, we, we like to have one one year. Yeah, right. that's that's our problem. <laughs> right. Uh, but, but I, I, I've seen passive source studies done with hybrid deployments. I don't know if they really let them there for that long time. I think they did. I think they did. Uh, I mean, but maybe one month is enough for ambient noise tomography. The the study that I showed before on ambient noise tomography, let, let me get back. This one, that was done with three weeks of it. Yeah, that's okay. my sentiment also. Yeah. So the problem with ambient noise tomography is that it's highly depending on the region. You know, if you have strong noise sources with just a few weeks is enough. If you don't, you might need two, three, four years. I I, I supervise. We're going to have the noise uh, both seismically and uh, oceanography. Yeah. So if we are lucky enough, you know, 45 days might be enough for an ambient noise tomography study. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? No? no. Yeah, we, uh, Jordi, you were talking about uh, mermaids, mm -hmm. uh, but, yes. we, but uh, in, in Brest, uh, I mean, Sarah is connected, she could, uh, Confirm, but we have uh, uh, hydrophones. We deploy. Uh, we can deploy in, uh, in the sofa channel. That they are onshore at the sea bottom, and they, uh, there is a, a cable, and they are left on the um, swimming in the sofa channel. But we never uh, did experiments with uh, mermaids. No. Okay. Uh, well, Jordi, I think it's uh, it's all. There is no more questions. So uh, I I think uh, I mean there were not a lot of people today. 
Okay, so Jordi left. <laughs> but uh, okay, let's close this and see you later. Yeah. <laughs> Dis, uh, Philippe, un truc à faire, mais moi, je sais pas comment faire.